Hello and welcome to How to Stay Married So Far. Been quite a challenging year, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it yes. really has. You know, my dad's had a stroke. Mm -hmm. Your mum got burgled. Our dog nearly died. I mean, just one thing after another. Um, and then you... Well, the your week, mum hasn't been well, My mum wasn't no. well. And then the week before our anniversary... Yeah. Um... You had, I don't know how to describe it, actually. I'm describing it as a breakdown. Would you describe it as a breakdown? Totally. Yeah. It's a okay. totally, rarely do I think the word suffices to describe something <laughs> in, in those instances. But yeah, it was. It was, it was literally, I broke down. So what had happened was, um, a few days before, let's just call it the breakdown, um, we'd gone to Bristol to see Mark's eldest daughter, hang out there for a couple of days. It's our first. That's Chi Chi, our dog. That's Chi Chi. Drinking. Drinking. Um, Chi Chi, the dog we nearly lost a, a month or so ago. Um, yeah, so we'd gone to Bristol. It was just as restrictions had been lifted. It was the first day that you could stay in a hotel. That's right, yeah. And so I booked it quite a bit ahead because I knew that was happening. We hadn't seen Izzy for ages mm. and her lovely boyfriend, Akran. Really looking forward to it. We went there. We were going to vlog it and we decided not to, didn't we? Mm. We decided that we just needed a couple of days just hanging out. Mm. Um, and it was lovely, but I felt that there was a little something going on for you. But if I'm honest... I always feel like there's a little <laughs> bit of something going on for you because there always is. Yes. And, and, you know, when we get halfway through this podcast, you'll discover why, <laughs> why that is. Anyway, so you weren't particularly happy, but you weren't terribly sad, but you were stressed, but with moments of real joy and relaxation. Mm. And you were loving being with the kids and we were loving being in a different city mm. and all of that. It's lovely to see you, isn't it? So um, then we came back. And the reason I'm telling this part of the story is that it's a bit blurry, I think, for you. Last time we spoke about it, it was a bit blurry about how it all happened. So I'll just mm. say my, from my perspective. So then we came back and we were all feeling kind of relaxed and quite nice. And Mark's mood absolutely plummeted. You, you plummeted. You really mm. did, babe. And I remember distinctly the moment where I thought this has gone beyond the normal plummeting. Um, if you know our kitchen, if you watch our vlogs and you watch us on YouTube, we've got a breakfast bar. That's the one just behind me if you're watching us. And then and, and uh, Mark was sitting just here at, uh, uh, on the chair here. And I was behind the I was behind the breakfast bar and both the kids were looking at me so they couldn't see Mark. And Maddie was telling a lovely story. She was chattering on the kind of thing. I don't know if you even remember this as I'm saying this. Do you remember yeah, this, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Very much. So, and she was chattering away about her friends. And it was actually a lovely moment. One of those yeah. rare moments for yeah. your team. You go, oh, my team seems quite happy. Oh, and she's telling all these lovely stories about her friends and what her friends had said about her and everything. And I looked over her shoulder and I was very aware that Mark, looked like he was hanging on for dear life, but I couldn't quite work out why. Mm. And he'd been kind of irritable with me through the day. And then suddenly you ran upstairs. And I was like, and if I'm honest, I was like, for fuck's sake, and you went, I've got to go. And you got your keys and you went upstairs and I was actually really pissed off because I had a day of the irritability that often comes with anxiety when somebody's anxious. I have it with the girls when they're anxious, they will get really irritable with me. So I was like, for fuck's sake, I've got to go. And I shouted something upstairs. I can't remember what it was. And you didn't answer back. Now, we have a very volatile relationship in lots of ways. And normally you would have gone, nah, nah, nah. you would have had to have the last word. And he didn't. And I thought, I just at that moment of thinking, that's a bit odd. And then um, I went back to the girls. So if you want to pick up from there, what was happening? Um... Uh, when you went upstairs, what happened? Because well, well, I no, don't no, know. I just, I just want to dial back a bit because when I was in Bristol, I, you know, you said there were moments of joy and moments of whatever. And the reason I'm kind of sort of stepping through this kind of in pigeon steps is because it might be useful and it might be helpful. Mm. Uh, and that's why we're kind of having the discussion. It might be useful or helpful to someone else who's going through things, who's trying to kind of navigate why they're feeling what they're feeling. Um, 
I didn't feel wholly present when I was in mm. Bristol. I felt like I was, and I've described this many times, I, um, this, I felt like I was hovering just behind my head. Oh yeah, because actually for a few weeks before that, you weeks, kept saying you were getting strange. strange yeah, I forgot thing. about I, that. I, I, we'd had a screening of my film with your parents. I felt so, I mean, that night we showed the film to your parents, I felt awfully disassociated from well, my body. Well, you, you likened it. You kept saying to me, I feel like almost like I've had drugs. Yeah. I like, like I've I was, had E. You yeah, kept yeah, yeah. saying well, that. You know, it kept reminding me of the, the feelings of, you know, back in the day, you know, MDMA and all that kind of stuff. And it was really disconcerting because it wasn't necessarily unpleasant, but it wasn't right. And I felt completely out of Disassociated. Yeah, yeah, totally disassociated. Well, I mean, I've maybe. never really understood what that meant before. Mm. Now, in terms of have I had that in the past, I mean, this will all become clear as to what was clearly happening in my brain and in my, in my head, because of course, you know, it develops and I, I saw someone and all that kind of stuff. And those who follow the channel know what the diagnosis was. But um, so in Bristol, I just, I felt that. Um, and then when we came back, as you were just retelling the story of me sat there and you were talking, the reason I, I, you know, I ran out of the room like I burnt myself. Mm. And the urgency came from, and I don't want to get. And the urgency came from precisely the fact that it was such a nice, you know, one of those scenes that as a parent of teenagers, you don't come along too often. And it was, it was lovely. And I felt awful that I felt awful. Um, and so, but there was, there was no choice. I had to escape this almost idyllic scene because I couldn't match it, I couldn't meet it. I couldn't be part of it. And I equally, I didn't want to pull it down. Was it almost like you were just above us all looking at us? I felt and you totally the... unrelated yeah. to it all. Mm. Um, and then I went upstairs and I just didn't want to deal. I didn't want to be in the world. I mean, I literally didn't want to be in the world. Um, and that state of mind persisted for pretty much 36 to 48 hours. Um, and I couldn't come out of the room. I wanted to stay in there. And, you know, our friend Michelle, um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't fully know the extent to which you and Michelle were working in the, back, in the background to kind of get me a psychiatrist or some form to talk to. But in terms of what I felt at that point, it wasn't like, narrative thinking it wasn't like i feel hopeless and this makes me feel like yeah. i need to remove myself i felt a total void i felt totally black like a matte black envelope had gone around me and i, I don't know whether this is a, a you know i don't know whether this is a symptom of when people really hit the edge of things i didn't feel scared i didn't feel i just didn't want to be in a body mm. i didn't want to be it wasn't even like i was thinking I, was, I didn't want to be a burden i just didn't want to be now that sounds horribly like oh i want to die and da, 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 da. And, you know subsequently i spoke to you know a psychiatrist and i know you'll talk about how i got that psychiatrist on the phone and their first urgent request was to know whether I'd, I'd had any what they call suicide ideation, which is kind of almost sort of not not idol, I, you know, not not idealizing. The hope is planted in. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think that that's a resolution, but like I said to him, I said no, I don't. It's feel almost like, like you could, you could, you, you park the idea as like if I can't bear it, that's what I'm going to do. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't at that stage, but I was at the point where I, as I said to the chat that you and Michelle eventually got. I said, I don't want to kill myself, but I said, I'm struggling with the point of living. Yeah. Um, and that was that, you know, that that was bad. And oh, I don't know. And so it felt very much like um, there'd been moments like this 
that I've used work, I've used um, family life, I've used in the past alcohol, all this, all, you know, I've Sex, used so drugs, much, yeah, to you know, medicate. Yeah, I've used so many, I, I, I think, in a weird way, I used anxiety mm. as a, as a, you know, what I've done is I've, I've funneled all that sort of dark energy into other shit so that I could just look away from whatever was going on, going on inside me or what, what I've discovered, whatever was actually happening neurologically inside me. Um, it's interesting what you should say there about anxiety, because I don't want to say the name, but somebody in our family, I've told you this, said to me a few months ago, oh, the problem is when the anxiety eases, the depression comes in. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, what an awful trap to be in. Well, well that's so you've really got point. So the you... fire or the frying yeah, pan, yeah. you know, anxiety, which is unbearable, yeah. or depression, which is unbearable. And it's anxiety, just... I mean, it's interesting. I've only kind of struck upon that thought now, is the, is the way in which anxiety works like workaholism, or works like... Exos, you know, constant exercise or works like constant kind of, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the, the ability to get away from, so, so it's no coincidence that because we'd taken took some time off, we'd said we were going to have a break from this. I just finished the film. We'd gone down to Bristol. We'd actively kind of said we're not going to do anything. And I just absolutely fell down a chasm because, and I think the first psychiatrist, I don't know if you want to talk about what was going on behind the scenes well, whilst... It, it, well, whenever you want. Well, no, do you want to talk about what was happening behind the scenes well, I think you and Michelle? Because I don't know what was happening. Yeah, well, carry on with what happened oh, right. with the psychiatrist. Well, no, because well, you haven't explained it. So you found a psychiatrist who I spoke to on the phone and he mm. did his initial assessment. Um, and uh, he, he essentially said, he said, you've been dodging a bullet it sounds like, for many, many years. Mm. And, and you've done so well yeah, to stay sober. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really yeah, important thing. I mean, he was thing. really, really blown. He said, the greatest thing you haven't done in the last few weeks is pick up a drink. Well, or in the last 16 years. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you've been managing yeah. this anguish and this pain. And, you know, for me, watching you in this breakdown, it was physical. It wasn't just mm, mental. Yeah, it, was. it was physical. Yeah, it, was. it was physical, like I've never seen. Um, I mean, it was accompanied with a literal. I mean, I can only describe it sometimes as a fizzing of the brain. It was like a. It was like an alka cell. Well, you were later told by the psychiatrist that that was the chemicals in your brain yeah, warning yeah. you that they yeah. couldn't do this for much well, and longer. And he said that, and he so he said on the phone, "Bless him." I mean, I'm incredibly indebted to him because, you know, we couldn't. You, or I seem to remember you saying you couldn't raise any kind of psych psychiatric help anywhere. I mean, you were phoning everyone, and you know, you know. And it was. Uh, it was. Well, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about that bit now because it was. Yeah, I mean, you know. Just to say, guys, we're talking about this now because I'm in a much more stable yeah. position. We wouldn't have spoken wouldn't, about this if Mark was still in no, a vulnerable no, no. state. Um, it was a, a petrifying time and I, you know, you, I've never, ever seen you like that. I mean, you were unable to get out of bed. You were in the fetal position and it was petrifying. And um, I, I was just desperate to get you seen by anyone. And this is the bit that breaks my heart for the whole of the rest of the bloody world. Because... First, I was told to try the GP. Well, I tried like non-stop to get through the GP. I think the first day that you went down was the weekend. I couldn't get through to anyone. Mm. Couldn't get through to any emergency services. Mm. And people were saying to me that the only thing you can do is ring 999. And I was like, I'm not going to ring 999. Mm. I can't ring 999. Mark, where he's at he wouldn't be able to go into an ambulance and then into a hospital and sit and wait for hours to sit. The, the, the man can't get up, you know. And I thought, my God, what a state of affairs that the only thing that you can do is call an ambulance. Well, we know there aren't any ambulances anyway. So I was frantic in between of being frantic with you and I was talking a lot to Michelle. I was like, what are people doing that don't have resources, mm. that don't have somebody that really loves them, mm. number of people that really loves them, trying everything mm. to get this person seen? Then it got to the point, and we obviously are financially stable. So then it was like, okay, 
I'm going to have to just pay whatever I need to pay to get him seen. Mm -hmm. So this is the next thing. I'm now going to pay anything to get you seen. And I couldn't get anyone to see you mm -hmm. because I was ringing Harley Street. I was ringing 24 hour psychiatrists. I was ringing all these things. Not even, I thought I'm just going to close my eyes and jump. I don't even know how much it's going to cost, but I'm so frantic. But nobody could see it. Mm -hmm. Three days, four days. And I'm thinking, so you're having a mental health crisis like there's somebody else and you've got nobody to phone and you've got no money. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just, it was really, it was really weird because I was, my heart was broken for you, but then I was thinking, what yeah, is yeah, everyone yeah. else doing? Well, subsequent to it and having ah. spoken to a, a number of people who, who, who know who they are, you know, it's just likewise seeing the struggle and hearing about the struggle that people have. I mean, in the end, the, the, the guy that, that Michelle kindly found for me, he talked to me for free. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he did. And that was a favour, pulled yeah. by a favour, pulled, pulled by a, a favour. Yeah. But meanwhile... Um, I had um, managed to get a top psychiatrist, which is somebody I knew that somebody I knew to agree to see you a week later. Mm. So the fact that we had someone parked for a week mm. was okay, mm. but I was still very, very scared because you were very, un very unwell. Well, it was interesting. Really, because, like, the first you weren't like, eating, the... drinking hardly. No, you're nothing. No. I mean, this was. This was the same. It was like I kept saying I'm very, I'm, I'm, to the I'm people also, I'm that a very movable person. I mean, the only person that yeah, you, I've never seen you like this no, ever. You no. push through everything, and the only person I could really talk to about this was Michelle, mm. because people that haven't witnessed it, like if somebody had told me about this before I'd witnessed it, I wouldn't have really understood. Like we we like to say we understand about mental. I mean, it's a journey understanding about mental health struggles because if you haven't had it it's like you can never fully understand what labor pain is like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. hard it's really hard yeah. and so i knew if i tried to explain to anyone else that had, did wasn't seeing this or wasn't a health mental health professional they would wonder a bit what i was talking about and so i thank god for michelle who i was able to talk to because I was really scared. My inclination is to want to say sorry, but I wasn't in control of myself. No, you, I mean, you know, no, I mean... I was just know, so scared for you and it was a really hard few weeks. There's no doubt about it. And I thank God for my friends that, like, supported me through it because, you know, they were all like, oh, my God, you know, how are you coping? How are you, you know, and I said, well, how we're coping is... That at the same time that this very, very frightening thing is happening, that feels completely out of our control, at the same time there's an enormous amount of love that's going on. I mean, I think I, you know, I think it really deepened how much I feel for you because I think. I really understood how much of our life that we've had together, when I found this, you know, when it's you've been in this half place and I've just thought you're down again. You've actually been struggling with these enormously difficult feelings. And so I think I felt a lot of guilt in those first, in those few weeks of the breakdown, because I think I was going, I was looking at you going, oh my God, I didn't know this is how bad. You, I always known you haven't been happy. And, and we've said, haven't we, often in our marriage and on this podcast, the hardest thing about me loving you is knowing that you're never happy. Mm. And that is really hard. And sometimes it's very hard if you're a happy person, if you're mm. quite a happy person, you almost, I feel a lot of guilt through my life because I feel like, you know, it must be just so hard. It's like eating when someone's starving. It's like gorging on a cake when somebody else is hungry. That's what it feels like sometimes. And I felt that so much more keenly in those few weeks. Where I was just like, oh, my God, this poor man. This is how he's been feeling in some way or another. Obviously mm. not that. Mm. And then when you saw the, the psychiatrist, finally saw the psychiatrist and he said, you've been struggling with this probably since you were five or six. Mm. It just broke mine and the girls' hearts. And... When I talk about the love that was going on in the house, that was also the same from the kids because we've never shied away from talking to them about mental health. And that's a big thing. I mean, we're seeing just this week in the press, the brilliant Simone Biles and yeah. the vile 
bile that people have poured upon her for being mm. brave enough to talk mm. about it. And the girls just moved around the house so sweetly and mm. so calmly and so, you know, with so much allowance and understanding and they weren't trying to fix and they weren't trying to rescue. Mm. And so it was, you don't really know any of this, mm. but it was very, very beautiful. So in one way, we were running alongside this terrifying precipice like you know where's this going to end is he going to come back because in my darkest moments i didn't know if he were going to come back no i, I was ever going to see you again no i, I well i genuinely didn't but i was it's weird because i feel and i don't mean in suicide i don't mean that i mean was mark because you weren't mark no but the weird the weird thing is it just struck me then because when, when i had the phone when i had the phone conversation with the first psychiatrist and he was so kind he was so gentle and he was so sympathetic. Thank God for him. He said, going back to what you were saying a minute ago, he said, I can't, you can't, he said, unless you've slashed your wrists open and you are Bleeding on the floor death. nearly dead, he said, that's one end of the spectrum, or you're running around the streets wielding an axe, you're not going to be able to, no, probably no one's going to be able no to sort of recognise what's going on for you or but, see you. Oh he said, but you were in as the, much pain as somebody with no, a burst no, no, no. appendix. And he, and he, said, he said, those are the two opposite ends of the spectrum. And he said, the system we have is not fit for purpose no. because you're at that point where as if you can't talk to me or someone, God only knows where you could but end But what up. do you have done if you, if, if we, if you hadn't had... I don't know, because the feeling, and then so the analogy I was going to use, and I don't know if this resonates for anyone else who struggles with their mental health, I felt like I was in space in that sense of, I don't know if you remember the film Gravity, and mm. George Clooney floats off. It wasn't entirely unpleasant. It was like, it was like I was suspended. Well, because you escaped yourself. Like the many yeah. times you've said to me over your years of sobriety, I just can't have a break from myself. <laughs> and you've said, And, and you've you said, that, and you know, you just that, a glass of wine that. gives us a break from ourselves. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah. You know, how many of you listening or watching take a break from yourself with a glass of wine? Yeah. And I think this breakdown was about you just taking a break from that fucking mind of yours mm. that t twists and turns and drives you crazy sometimes, you know. And as the psychiatrist that you eventually saw, said you've been coping since you were probably five or mm. six this mm. started for you mm. and you have been finding so many different ways to cope and that that feeling in your brain that 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 tingling almost it were the it was a warning from your brain yeah, going well, you've got to do something because i can't cope anymore well i mean and the fascinating thing i found out was that you know i was diagnosed as bipolar uh, bipolar two, two and uh, with add um so shocking. We never, because I, I made it, we never thought you were ADD. No, I think you're more ADHD, which is... <laughs> we were which is, uh, What is it? What is it? What is it? Attention, Attention Deficit, deficit Hyperactive, hyperactive disorder. disorder. Yeah. Um, although, fucking hell, I mean, you're right, I go hyperactive as well, don't I? was just like, okay, um, I'm just going to let no, 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 go. <laughs> what, was, what was interesting was when he said, you know, that bipolar sits within the epile epileptic spectrum. Mm. And he said, so, I mean, you know, when he said this, if you think about it, all depression is a neurological thing. Well, you know, well no, because some people can have depressive times because a lot of yeah, terrible things lot have of things, happened. Yeah, but it's and how then they, you pro, you know. Yeah, I mean, but not everyone has a chemical no, imbalance. Exactly. Um, and his his take on that was you've had difficult things or you've struggled with difficult things, but you've had running alongside that. So when you've hit those downs, you've you've in a sense you've exploited in a bad way, all of the shit that you you can't deal with in yourself because it's like as what you, do you mean? I don't know well, it's like you just said then. You just said you you wanted a break from your own mind, and actually, what cut me just then was I don't feel any warmer towards myself. I don't feel any more. Mm. I, I still feel like that about myself. I don't. Well, we'll want, get to that. I don't we'll want get to be to in that. my head, and yet mm. at the same time, I'm not in that position fetal upstairs you know not, and not i would say you're not in the position that you were before the fetal no no no, no, no so i've exactly. noticed enormous no, exactly movements. and 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 yet fundamentally my feeling towards myself hasn't changed i can feel that and so 
and what I mean by exploit, I don't mean in a sort of cynical fashion. I mean that there's a lot of stuff you can go to that is real, you know, in terms of your alcoholism, the, the sense of, uh, you know, abandonment issues, isolation, the, the being left on your own so many times as a child, the uncontrollability, the sudden sort of moments of violence and extreme behaviour, the volatility of behaviour. And one of the biggest, biggest eye-openers for me was being told that bipolar 2 can run in families. Well, and that he and he's pretty sure that your mum has it. Well, he's pretty and sure your my mum has it. My grandmother has it and my maternal uncle. But he went very deeply, if, if nobody's very ever deeply. been to a psychiatrist, very he deeply. went very deeply, wrote copious notes, oh my God. asking Mark everything about about his family. Um, what I would like to say just in the interim period, and as like, you know, if somebody is, is the partner of somebody and mm. listening to this is, what I was imagining, what did I want when I was trying to ring everybody and trying to get some help? I imagined that somebody was going to be able to give him a prescription to get him through those days of agony. Mm. That's not true. There was no prescription. There was nothing. People were saying four days, five days a week. And I'm like, but what am I going to do? He's in agony. What am I going to do? There, there was nothing. Mm. Because you've got to have a proper diagnosis. Mm. You know, this is the chemicals of your brain. You can't get knocked out with a Valium. There isn't. That's what I kind of mm. imagined. He needs something to get him through until he can see a psychiatrist. That wasn't on the table from anyone, so that was a big scary. No, moment. the first psychiatrist. Because I thought, how are we going to get him yeah. to next Monday when he sees a psychiatrist? Mm. And then when you saw the psychiatrist, it was then, I'll go away for a couple of weeks and I'm going to think about it. It was like, what? Well, still, there's mm. going to be nothing to help this mm. massive chemical imbalance that's mm. going on in his brain. And that, so I just want to put that out there for anyone listening to just know that that's not how it works and recalibrate because. Mm. Even when you've got money to throw at it, it doesn't happen that way. Well, and also, I mean, just because there's a kind of hole in the story. So I was in, from fetal position, I can't really recall how I sort of came out of that because I just saw, I just gently, and it was through the loving support of you guys, I just gently kind of re-emerged, didn't I, in a sense? Well, I mean, in the vlog that we're currently putting out at the moment, I'm at that point where I think I've just had the breakdown and we're just about to meet for our anniversary. You'd, you'd had three or four days where you were completely unable to mm. like speak or get up or anything then you just emerged but you were in a very bad place mm. very we went away for a couple of days for our anniversary and you were just we had dinners booked and mm. stuff didn't we? we went to a hotel but we just stayed in because mm. you were just you just felt very you i kept saying to you you look like you feel like you're made of glass that's what it looked like yeah, i felt like my skin had been flayed and it not like not like quivering sort no, of no. but just very careful you were just move i knew everything you were doing was a gargantuan effort and you were mm. trying to do it for me and so and that went on for a long while mm. a long while i didn't even know ever if you were going to be okay mm. and then a, a week later you saw the psychiatrist and well you well that was where the diagnosis happened that's where the diagnosis happened mm. and then it was and then you were in a really bad place after that because there was still no mm. chemical rebalancing then you got we're not going to say what drugs you were given because i think it's important not to say it because I people want to align it too much but i i because everybody is different yeah, you know yeah, yeah. but um <clears throat> he was diagnosed pre prescribed two different drugs weren't you and we looked those up and that was a very you know you might think oh i'm going to get the drugs and then i'm going to feel okay mm. it's all going to be okay but actually we felt more scared mm. because we learned from when you had antidepressants that there was the, well, the yeah, I mean, and that's was... an interesting part of the story actually tell them what you what, what he said about the antidepressants why they never work for you well, i can't remember what he said because he said they won't work for somebody with bipolar. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, because yeah, wrong diagnosis, wrong, wrong drug, essentially. Yeah, yeah and yeah, you were yeah. given you were, you tried two or three different antidepressants, didn't you? And they never kind of really made any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't make any difference. And he yeah. said, "Well, they won't do because yeah, they're treating the wrong thing." They're treating the wrong thing, and he yeah. also said, "You're only supposed to be on those for a very short amount of time, anyway." Yes. Those those kind of antidepressants. But if anyone's that, on, if anyone's on either of those drugs, you check with your GP first. Nobody change anything mm. they're doing from this conversation. We are just mm. people sharing our experience with absolutely no qualification. Mm. So, well, I mean, again, I went through that whole thing that I did at the beginning beginning with, with citalopram, which is, oh shit in hell. So of course the bipolar, everyone, I think probably when you hear the word bipolar, I, I would guarantee everyone thinks of that 
oscillator. Yeah. Everyone, I everyone never knew. Really, I never thought you were bipolar. Everyone sort of thinks of that. Oh, you're crazy. Of followers have buying said everything, and yeah. then and then you're not, and then you're on the floor like depressed. Yeah. So I've always just thought, well, it's not. I mean, the kids, like, when we told Maddie yeah, that Mark had been surprised. diagnosed with bipolar too, she goes, oh, wasn't he already? We're like, no. She goes, Oh, I told, all my friends think Dad's bipolar too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like a funny moment in a very dark time. Mm. Um, yeah, but I had that, I re-had that moment, and I think Stephen Fry talked about it in his documentary, didn't he? Where, <laughs> as, the psych as the psychiatrist I met said, everyone asks me, can I keep the ups and remove the downs? I mean, strangely, and we'll get onto this in a minute, um... I feel a little bit blessed in that department <laughs> in terms of where I'm at in my treatment. Um, but yeah, I remember fa feeling very fearful of putting anything in my body. I was like, you know, we were all a bit concerned about the vaccine and all that kind of stuff. It's like, what is this going to do to me? I know I can't be like that. So, but it didn't feel necessarily like a silver bullet. It didn't feel like, you know, I've been dodging bullets. And I, I was very scared. Bullet. I was very scared of it, especially as like, you know, I there's all kinds of... I sort of drooling idiot in the corner. You know what it's like? You look up these things on Google and it's like the side effects are just absolutely mm. petrifying. Mm. And, you know, you can have a massive allergic reaction to this drug and everything, all this sort of stuff. So you have to start it very slowly, don't you? Because they're watching for any allergic mm. reactions. So as your partner, again, because I'm aware of there's going to be people listening that are the partner of, mm. you know, you're trying to balance that thing where I'm like, part of me wants to go, oh God, can't you, can we just go a bit longer without you taking them and see if you're, you're going to be all right. But actually, you know, with the diagnosis that Mark had had and the fact that this psychiatrist said your brain is giving, this is what I kept thinking, your brain's giving you a warning that it can't keep doing it the way that it is. And so it's like, I'm trying to keep all my fears about, you know, and I'm a very holistic person. I try and do everything naturally where I can. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, oh, God, he, what, what could he be? And Mark kept saying, what if I'm a dribbling wreck in the corner? What if I'm a fat, bold, dribbling wreck in the corner? <laughs> because this, he'd read some... Zombification. Some, what if I'm a zombie? What if I'm this? What if I'm that? And, and oh, of course, he was, was needing weird. to say that. But, of course, every time he said that, I was fearful for him with that as well. But I'm having to keep going, well, you know, you know, it's only it's rare or it's mm. common or it's let's just wait and see. And... Um, the first few weeks of the drugs were like pretty not great. Mm. And then even two, Whoa. 10 days ago, you had a real drop oh where you God. had a breakdown day. I'm calling it the breakdown day. I came down here and I had a moment where I was just literally rocking on the floor, just going, oh my God. Oh my, because you were, because the thing is when you get very anxious and again to any partners of, you, you like, we all do it we take it out on the person closest to us and you were just being so like angry and paranoid like I was not saying anything but you're being and that's been a bit of the thing the journey that's finished now thank god but there's been quite a bit of paranoia and it's like you know what paranoia is like if somebody tells you you've been paranoid you're like why are you telling me mm. and so it was a bit like that I was like I don't know how to manage this so well, that, that, that I've had breakdown, a lot of weeks of feeling very eggshell it was really disconcerting because I mean one of the I things the psychiatrist so both the psychiatrists said is that yes we can you know the drugs can sort of even things out but he said it doesn't mean you're not going to have a, an episode. Well, this was it because was that like, oh, night, Mark was supposed to be doubling his dose. And I was like, please don't double it yet. You've got to speak to the doctor tomorrow because I don't know whether this is a reaction. Very scary, really scary. And I know some of you will have gone through it from this side. And I was thinking, fuck, I mean, mm. he's like, he's gone so down. This you're could be so another awful. breakdown. He's so angry. He's paranoid. The drugs have fucked up his brain. Anyway, it was really good. And then I booked him an appointment to talk to the doctor. Classic man. Well, I don't know what I'm going to talk to him about. The next morning, mm. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me that you don't know what you... And I was like, because I was going out and I was like, terrified you weren't going to have the appointment. <laughs> which is very, very hard, isn't it, partners of, when they won't bloody see anyone. So, But anyway, you did, thank God. Because I said, I don't care. Yeah, That's what bad. I said. It was bad enough. I said to you... I don't care whether you think it, you should or not. You've got to do this for me. That's mm. what I actually... And I saw you go. Because you're very reasonable like that. You will see sense. And thank God you did. Because when you spoke to the doctor, and he just said, these are the dips you might get. Mm. And it just... Mm. Oh, it just made you feel so much better. Mm. And then... So you doubled the dose. And now... And by the way, I've doubled again. Last I night. can't believe it. And I'm touching wood. 
But for me, you seem the best you've mm. ever been in all the years I've known you. Bloody hell. Can I give the example of what happened the other day when you were outside? And you yes, yes. So, so a lot of Mark's, your bipolar and your... Yeah, it manifests in self social anxiety. You would say that he's incredibly, you're incredibly sociable yeah. and you're incredibly able, but inside you Don't hate do talking to anyone. You can't do chit chat. Mm. You can't. So he came in the other day and he went, Oh, I bumped into so and so, somebody we know. And I was like, Oh my God, are you all right? Oh mm. God. And I went into this total panic. Yeah, that's where I was. I was to, that's why I was late. I was talking for 15 minutes. Took 15 minutes. And did you see me? Did, were you able to yeah, see my reaction? Yeah, and he so went, cool. Yeah, it was fine. We talked about da 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 da. I was like, I didn't say anything to you at the point. I was like, fucking hell. Later on, I said to Maddie and Gigi, guess what? Daddy bumped into da da da, and he spoke to him for fifteen minutes, and and they went, oh my god. <laughs> and I said, but he said, oh, he enjoyed it, and they were like, what? <laughs> yeah, but you know, again, talking on the side of the people that live with people with mental health, it also showed us what. It's like for everybody living with this, mm. with the f scary thing of a mental health illness, mm. which is what I even now I stumble a bit on illness because I don't want to say you're ill mm. because of what does that sound like? What does that look like? But it's funny, isn't it? Because what even, do you, how do you like to talk? What do you like to say? Well, it's weird because, you know, we've had lots of sort of, you know, people like Piers Morgan, let's call them. Let's not name who, him who, ever. Who, no, but people like him who have rubbished the idea that we struggle with anything, who troll... I think he who, struggles. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, he struggles with his mental health, and that's yeah, why he points his finger. The funny thing is, though, most sort of trolley-type people and people who are circumspect and arched-eyebrowed about it all have a deep mental health problem. This is what James O'Brien... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what James O'Brien said yesterday. Yeah. He said, I used to be the person that used to say, pull yourself together. Mm. And he said, now, this is, the, you know, presenter on LBC, he said, I was the worst... Mm. He said, and then it happened, but, and but then it happened to me, exactly. and I realised I'd been attacking people because, because I, I was frightened of what I was feeling. And it's like all things. It's like racism. It's like homophobia. It's like, if you don't understand something, mm. unfortunately, thank God I don't feel like that about a lot of things, but it seems right, a lot of people seem to feel it's right to attack, mm. to criticise, to question, to somehow get under it and disqualify. This is the word that I'd like to use. People are very keen to disqualify mm. the idea that people are going through something. So, you know what I felt as I sat in front of the psychiatrist and he was sitting there doing all of this and he was going through it in such intimate detail and we were talking through so many things I've not even talked about with you. And he came to this very clear assessment. It felt almost like being given my graduation certificate mm. because I felt like, it's not that, not that they bother me, but it felt like, look, there's no shadow of doubt here. Because we've been wandering, I've been wandering around in this hinterland of going, what is it? What, what we is use it? the word anxiety. Da, 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 da. I mean, all yeah. these things are happening when I'm on a down. You could, you could use all of them, depressed, mm. anxious, uh, mm. paranoid. But it can, something chemical happens something in your brain. Something chemical is happening in my brain that takes me to a down place where I can then, mm. as what I meant by exploit earlier, it was where I can then run from that to that to that, and it takes me further mm. down. It's like when my dad checks his sugar every day. You know, yeah. that's the imbalance in yeah, his body. Yeah. It just happens to shift up a yeah, bit yeah, yeah. to your head, yeah, exactly. to your brain, the most extraordinary organ. Yeah. Do people, how do we have such a problem thinking yeah. that this extraordinary organ could yeah, just, yeah, yeah. for some people, the, the chemicals aren't quite right? I mean, I suppose... and, you've, and it's hereditary. Exactly. You know, you've, you've, you've inherited this. Mm. And when you look through the line of your family, there's oh, been a lot God. of carnage, hasn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, the, 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 the worry with that is, is that it can be passed, obviously, down to, to children. So, you know, I mean, I think if I have any concern looking forward, it's the fact that I felt just as awful on breakdown day as I did in the breakdown. And I feel <laughs> this kind of new anxiety where I don't want that to happen too mm. often. And the GP mm. and the psychiatrist have both said, we cannot guarantee that, the drugs cannot guarantee that. Nothing is a 100, like the vaccine, mm. nothing is a 100% solution. Do you, do you feel, because having that blip 10 days or so ago and it passing the next day, well, it didn't pass completely, but it just ebbed away. 
do you think the next time that starts to come, you can, you'll be able to say, oh, hello, right, okay, this is really fucking awful, but I know it will pass. Or is it still too consuming when it Well, that, that day I was in a mess. I was you couldn't only, see it. I was only saved by, what was the Disney film that Maddie made us watch? Um, Luca. Yeah, in the evening, Maddie made us watch Luca. I, and I was saying... Well, we forced you down the stairs because you wanted me. to... I said, no, yeah, yeah. you're not. And that, that was a scary moment because I didn't know whether I should force you or whether I should leave you, but I just felt my instinct no, I don't, say, I, The thing that come frightens down. me about that is is that it's it's not... I haven't been on both occasions able to... And this, this must be the consequences of managing it, managing it, managing mm. it and not falling into this pit. Though, when you look back at when I massively, if you like relapsed when I tried to be sober and then I crashed after all of my foreign travels that year. That was clearly attached that to was, alcohol. Yeah. Something equivalent. That's the only other time yeah. in my life I can think. But then I that started to awful. chant through my twenties and in my teen and this is what I do with a psychiatrist and on many occasions which was sort of hurtling back at me. I was going Well you put yourself in positions where you could have died. Oh that's God, it. It was a, I mean when you put your hand through many the window times. and you bled on I mean well, that's incredible also, that I mean, you didn't die that, that I night. did with drugs and drink. It yeah. was just ludicrous. It was just stupid. Well you know and You I've got like, yourself through the bipolar downs yeah, by doing those yeah. things. But there it's but a miracle the grace of God I didn't doing. kill myself as well. Because you know the whole thing about alcohol and drugs is that it just amplifies that sort of incoherence. And that matte black floating in space thing, there was no ability on that breakdown day for me to rationalise. You couldn't it. see a pin and on that's the fear. That's the mm. worry and that's the fear is because there isn't like a sort of plane coming into land where you go, all oh, right, I can manage this. Yeah. It's like... Poof. You don't, you and can't feel the, the turbulence. Remember, it in the car. And once oh, again, you were annoyed with me because quite understandably... What do you mean once again I was annoyed? No, 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 no. I meant once again it happened to me <laughs> oh, right. in the same way. But you were annoyed because it did present itself. And this is my, where my heart goes out to the partners of people. It was presenting itself to you as a really odd man Angry. in a mood driving the car. Yeah, I didn't realise you'd gone into the breakdown place again. You were just so angry. It was mm. just like, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> there we go, guys. That's the portrait of our... So, I mean... But the, the hope at the end of this story is that I I see you better than you've ever mm. been. Mm. Exactly. Um, and I hope it's of use to you guys yeah. just to hear that story. Yeah. Big hug to anyone going yeah. through it. We fucking know how fucking hard it is. So, and if you are somebody struggling alone, God, I my heart goes out to you. And please do reach out because the places like the Samaritans are there and they do pick up. Um, and if you use any substances <sighs> to get you through stuff, I mean, it's really stuck with me how the first psychiatrist was so impressed and almost proud that he didn't know me. He said, it's the greatest thing you've done is to maintain your sobriety. Incredible, I'm so and, proud And of I would you. just say, you know, for anyone who knows anyone who's struggling and you feel that alcohol is the problem, obviously I'm not suggesting you do an intervention because that could be catastrophic if they're at the point where they're... But try and just nuzzle them away from it because that will mm. just... Uh, uh, you know, it will only make it worse. It may numb you, as it has done for... Did, did used to for me. And then how it's interesting how subsequent to sort of giving up alcohol... I moved into so many other behavioural addictions. Mm. Or, or Shopping, starving. Well, no, no, but also, you know, jealousy and anxiety and all those kind of things, the workaholism, everything, you know. To take you away from the down. Take you away from the down, yeah, mm. absolutely. Oh, God, it's been a journey, love. Yeah, hasn't yes. it? I'm very proud of you, I love oh, you. Me too. Good night. <laughs> Thanks for being there. <laughs> <laughs> Because I know so many people don't have that. Mm. Mm.